so my name is Yogesh, um, and hello. Uh, my name is Yogesh, and I am an uh, engineering manager here at LinkedIn, uh, working on the EU platform. Um, and I would like to welcome you guys on behalf of LinkedIn EU team, LinkedIn, and now Microsoft. So, um, before we start, uh, I just want to go through some uh, housekeeping uh, stuff. Like, we do have food back there, drinks. Uh, the restroom is uh, straight uh, and to the left. We do have pizza coming as well at 7 o'clock, so stay around at least till 7. <laughs> um, so, before I hand off to the next speaker, I just want to give a little bit of history uh, on where we were like four years ago and where we are now um, and the way we are using AEM here. Uh, so, I mean, four years ago when this project started, LinkedIn was still like kind of a startup. Uh, and then we had our sites, <coughs> which we actually use AEM for right now. I mean, uh, to be clear, we don't use AEM for LinkedIn.com. We use AEM for all the other uh, microsites, which we call it, uh, which comms and other people uses uh, for like internal and external communication. Uh, through that, we get more than millions of, I mean, millions of requests a day, uh, like including both internal and external microsites. And we do have more than 100 of internal and external microsites that we host using the AEM platform. Uh, so back then, like four years ago, uh, we had our site hosted on WordPress. And uh, and as if you have worked on WordPress before or any PHP uh, stack, you know that how easy to hack that shit. And that's what happened <laughs> with our sites as well. And that was one of the driving factor why we actually used, uh, we actually onboarded AEM uh, to this company. Uh, we started with very basic implementation of AEM. Back then we were using CRXD to actually do the compilations and everything. Uh, that, that's sucky, but um, that's how it used to work. And we used to do the deployment through CRXD on production instances. So you can imagine how often our site used to pay. Uh, but since then, um, we came a long way. Um, the LinkedIn philosophy is actually, LinkedIn is member first company. So the member data, securing member data and keeping their privacy is really, really important to LinkedIn. Um, it's good in a way that, you know, we provide a very intuitive and amazing experience to LinkedIn member, uh, but it's not good for third party software. So it provides a lot of limitations if we are using any third party software, AEM is one of them. So other companies like they do have a privilege to use a lot of uh, cloud-based software for their need. For for example, for analytics, you can go ahead and use like Google Analytics or Adobe Analytics solutions. For deployment and all, you can use Jenkins or other Bitbucket softwares. For monitoring, you can use other software. For GMX monitoring, you can use other software. Um, but with LinkedIn, using cloud software is kind of a no-go. So in this talk, we kind uh, we are going to talk about how we use current LinkedIn infrastructure that amazing engineering team in LinkedIn has built for anything starting from like doing the coding to the deployment to the monitoring and even doing the personalization and everything uh, with AEM stack. So the one thing um, I want you guys to get from this talk is if you have like uh, good infrastructure within within your company, like you have a good engineering team, you can integrate AEM with any other softwares within the team to, to actually achieve your need. Uh, with that, I'm going to give this to Bo and Apaji to talk about how we use AEM at scale here at LinkedIn. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Vivi. All right, everyone. Uh, my name is Bo, and this is Apaji. Uh, both of us are backend software engineers on the CMS team here at LinkedIn. So in this part of the talk, we're going to uh, give you a high-level overview of how we here at LinkedIn leverage 
AEM to empower LinkedIn communication and marketing sites at LinkedIn scale. Uh, so yeah, so at LinkedIn, we leverage AEM to empower our communication marketing sites uh, like business.linkedin.com or uh, learn, learning.linkedin.com. Um, so the, uh, the previous one is, uh, can you go back? Yeah, so this is a screenshot of our business.linkedin.com and the next slide is a screenshot of our learning.linkedin.com and those beautiful sites are, are empowered by AEM. So behind the scenes, our work on top of AEM follows this typical development cycle. So there are a few phases uh, from develop to build, test, deploy, and monitor. So develop is the phase where we uh, implement LinkedIn specific features on top of AEM and integrate that with uh, LinkedIn technologies. Uh, build is the phase where we generate artifacts. Uh, test is the phase where we assure quality of our artifacts. Deploy is the phase where we uh, install our artifacts to production instances. And monitor is the phase where we watch the performance of our sites. So uh, in, in, the, in the rest of the talk, we're going to uh, cover these topics one by one. So we're going to start with develop. And I'm just going to talk about the develop part. OK, um, so when it comes to development on AEM, we start with developing templates. We start with developing components on AEM. Um, so that's typically a development environment. What is uh, what tells me to integrate with that LinkedIn when it comes to um, leveraging the LinkedIn uh, stack? Um, one, of, one of them is uh, member integrating with member data. So we use uh, LinkedIn OAuth. Uh, to integrate and retrieve the member data for authorization purposes. So this can be um, any app external can be integrated with LinkedIn API to be able to provide an option for users to log in using their LinkedIn um, login and then access restricted access. So you can find more information on what on developer.linkedin.com. That's a very good resource for uh, visiting. Um, to know more about what this could be used uh, to let what uh, to retrieve remote information and use that information for uh, personalization. So when it comes to personalizations, two uh, um, aspect that we need to provide for personalization. One is creating experiences in AEM, which is basically uh, what we display for a user, and creating uh, segments, uh, which is basically defining the audience. Um, the type of audience and based on the audience uh, type of experience that they are going to get. Um, that's that's the uh, customization uh, which is LinkedIn experimentation that we get here. Um, and uh, segments is uh, one we are customizing based on uh, work as well as uh, member data. Um, so we have LIX to define based on the member information uh, what to display in area. In addition, um, tracking. Tracking is the key piece for us to be able to uh, uh, see how the application is uh, behaving and then uh, tune uh, back. Um, so with respect to tracking, if you are familiar with LinkedIn uh, technology that is used for tracking, um, uh, real-time user metrics from um, uh, similar technologies. Um, you can find more on immediately.com website about how LinkedIn uses ROM as well as other uh, tools for tracking purposes. And in our case for microsites, we are um, using um, client side uh, page events to uh, trigger uh, data for us uh, to Kafka. And uh, the data is used by HDFS to give us some metrics uh, for tracking purposes and as well as tuning. Um, and another integration or customization that we did on AM is forms. Um, so when we started with AM 5.5.5.6.1, um, uh, forms was the key requirement where uh, we should be able to support authors being able to create uh, forms on demand as well as support IATM for forms. 
uh, being able to integrate with a LinkedIn API. So because a contact is form, you don't need to type in your information. You can log in and auto fill the information into the form. Um, so we have the uh, integration and custom framework created for forms. And uh, that's one of the source for lead generation. Um, so these, these are the four aspects, high level, we uh, try uh, integrating with the existing LinkedIn stack as part of the development. Um, moving on to the next step, who is going to? Yeah, so the next phase is build. Uh, just to recap, build is the phase where we generate artifacts. And there are two types of artifacts we generate typically. One is uh, bundle jar files. Uh, two is package zip files. Uh, in terms of uh, the build automation system we use, we use Gradle as opposed to Maven. Uh, one of the, 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 the primary reason behind that is that um, Gradle is the recommended build system here at LinkedIn. So it fits really well into the LinkedIn tool chain. And that's what we want to get ourselves onto as well. Uh, but there are a few benefits that we get by using Gradle for building AEM artifacts. One is that Gradle build scripts are concise, they are really short, and very easy to understand. Two, uh, they are very extensible and programmable. So if you want to override some of the, uh, the, the default behaviors of the tasks, you can easily do that just by writing some Groovy code, just as you would do in some other scripts. Uh, the third thing is that uh, Gradle uh, project structure is very much flat. Uh, it's not like in Maven where uh, hierarchical uh, structures are, are allowed, but here it's very flat, so it's easy to, uh, for you to manage the projects. Uh, to, to be able to build those artifacts, the, uh, the bundle job files, the zip package files, we need to use Gradle plugins. Um, we rely on third-party open source plugins for doing that because no other team that LinkedIn have done this before and we don't want, want to uh, reinvent the wheels if there are resources out there that we can leverage. Uh, so we actually pick uh, the Gradle plugins from uh, Time Warner uh, Cable. They have two very good plugins, one for building AEM uh, bundles, the other for building uh, AEM packages. Yeah, so uh, both of them are great. Uh, we can use them out of the box. Uh, they fit our needs very well. Only one exception, uh, exception to that is the package plugin, which allows only uh, including Java files in the install folder. So in our case, we want uh, the, job, uh, the bundle Java files to be installed on uh, publish and author instance differently. Some of them, we want them to appear only in author instance, but not publish. Some others, appear only in publish, but not author. So we, we needed to be able to let us uh, put bundles under install slash author and install slash publish. So we had to write our own extension of the tasks uh, from, those, uh, from that package plugin. And that worked out pretty well too. So again, that also shows how powerful uh, Gradle is in building AEM related stuff. Um, the next uh, bullet we want to talk about is Java 7 versus Java 8 environment. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to talk about that. Yeah, with respect to build, um, we recently migrated to Java 8. Um, uh, when we compile the code, uh, we are we are okay. There is no issues with the code other than a simple target type inference uh, change. But uh, the key piece is generating the service descriptor files. Uh, that are uh, deployable on uh, Java 8 instances, which is where, again, the TWC plugins that uh, both talked about that we uh, customized uh, to support install and author and publish. Um, so th uh, those, uh, those are the aspects that we need to uh, customize a little bit when we migrated to Java 8 um, with respect to build. Um, so let's move on to the next phase of this life cycle. Yeah, <clears throat> so the next phase is test. So that's where we uh, make sure that our the quality of uh, the artifacts are good. Right? Uh, so we do uh, run tests at different phases of the development cycle. So it's actually everywhere. Um, very first is Java unit tests. That's pretty typical. So we have Java unit tests as part of every bundle that we develop. And we enforce code coverage 
uh, on those bundles when they build. Uh, the next one is JavaScript unit tests. Uh, that's something that probably other AM projects don't have. Uh, so in our build, we also make sure that our JavaScript unit tests are run and pass. And later in another part of the talk, uh, Varun and Gladden will talk about uh, more details on, on this aspect. Uh, the next one is integration and selenium tests. Uh, so these are the tests that we run every time development, uh, sorry, deployment happens. Right? So we run integration tests and selenium tests against our staging and production uh, instances after deployment. So integration tests are there to make sure that all our servlets are running correctly, uh, all the services are running correctly, and all the pages are returning uh, the right responses as expected. And Selenium tests are there to ensure that the interactions on those pages and sites are uh, as expected. Right. Another tool that we have and we run every time a deployment happens is Visual Diff. So this tool is to detect uh, the difference between, uh, between this build and the previous build in terms of visual appearance. So this is to make sure that there's no unintended differences. If there are, we may need to look back and see if uh, any changes break uh, what we wanted. So that's about testing. And the next phase is deploy. So again, deploy is about uh, installing uh, artifacts to our production staging instances. And Apache is going to elaborate on this infrastructure of how we deploy our artifacts. So uh, when it comes to infrastructure, if you look at this deployment diagram, uh, it's a typical AM uh, deployment diagram where we have author instance for creating content and uh, publish the content to publish instances and cache uh, the static content on dispatchers. Um, what do we need to do, do differently at LinkedIn? Um, one is uh, AM is third party product, as you mentioned, um, and there are security concerns about deploying third party products on LinkedIn um, along with LinkedIn applications. Um, so. So we, uh, we uh, one of the options that we addressed it with is by creating a DMZ zone um, for third party applications. Um, so all the AEM uh, application instances are in a DMZ with a controlled access and um, using Apple's, uh, the access from AEM instances to other applications um, is uh, controlled. Um, the next, uh, big thing is scalability and maintainability. How do we make sure that uh, we are able to um, uh, address the increase in traffic, as well as address the failovers, um, as well as improve the response times? So if we take uh, each aspect, uh, one is uh, um, addressing the increase in traffic. Um, so LinkedIn has a, a dynamic uh, host uh, deployment system that's built in. Um, so it's basically a group of hosts available as pool, and when there is a need, uh, if uh, our application is a LinkedIn compatible LinkedIn compatible application, uh, it can deploy that application automatically to the host based on the increased traffic. So recently, we were able to achieve that uh, almost by making AEM application as compatible LinkedIn application so that we can deploy dynamically. Um, maintainability um, failovers. So you can see here uh, we have uh, multiple data centers to uh, address uh, the load balancing need. And uh, in front of the data centers, we have the Apache traffic server uh, as proxy server. Um, if we are familiar with how LinkedIn um, is able to uh, address uh, and improve the response times. It's basically using uh, pops, uh, point of presence. Where what it basically does is there are multiple pops around the, throughout the world, and um, based on user location, a nearby pop is resolved, and the pop is going to uh, forward the request to data centers. In our case, it is dispatchers. Um, so that uh, by using pops, we are able to um, minimize the network latency by uh, finding nearby data center and uh, sending the content back to a user from the nearby data center. Um, and also we have CDNs on top of uh, the dispatcher caching. So uh, all the static assets 
or crashed on CDN as well. And also from an application perspective, um, it is stateless, uh, which is basically mean we can cache as much as only the dynamic content request will be forwarded to publishing instance. That, that's how we were able to minimize the load on to publish and uh, support the increasing traffic and cache uh, mag, uh, max on dispatcher. Uh, that concludes uh, about the infrastructure. Now, who is going to elaborate more on how are we deploying the applications? Yeah, so uh, the typical way of deploying uh, AVM packages or uh, bundles is through call commands. But in our case, we don't want to do that because we don't want to expose admin password in plain text in our web view scripts. Uh, and also, we want to be very much consistent with uh, what the rest of LinkedIn engineering uses in, in deploy. Uh, so uh, the way we deploy is that we actually leverage uh, the hot deploy feature of AEM uh, to make it happen. Uh, so what essentially uh, happens is that we copy uh, the package zip file into the install folder of uh, each uh, AEM instance. It does not matter whether it is a published instance or it is an author instance. It uh, works very well, so the AEM instance will detect the, uh, the change in the install folder and it's gonna uh, install uh, the uh, uh, AEM package, and then all the bundles will be reloaded uh, to get the new versions of them. Uh, typically, it takes less than a minute for all the bundles to be refreshed and, and uh, became more active. Uh, but of course, there is this short period of time where they are not fully active, and they might, they might not be responding uh, correctly, and that's why we have implemented this health check uh, feature where the, the published instances will be able to scan over all the bundles and see their status and let the dispatcher know whether they are ready or not. And so before they are ready, uh, they would uh, let the dispatcher not to uh, forward the traffic to those published instances. But once they are ready, meaning all the uh, bundles are active and responding, uh, it's going to let the uh, dispatcher know, yeah, you can start uh, forwarding the traffic to me. And that's, uh, that's essentially taking uh, boxes or published boxes out of rotation or back into rotation. Right? So uh, the next thing is rollback. Yeah, so uh, at times there is the need for rolling back your releases. Um, and, and it is the reverse process of deploy. Since we use pod deploy for deploying, it also makes natural sense to, to utilize this again for rolling back. So what happens when we do rollback is essentially that uh, we remove the current version of the package that we have copied into the install folder of the EM instance. And then after that, we, we uh, copy again the earlier version of the package into the install folder. And that would make sure that the EM instances will roll back uh, the package into the previous version correctly. Um, another thing I want to talk about is Canary. Um, so in our published uh, instances in uh, production, we have this concept of can uh, canary where we sort of uh, deploy uh, to certain boxes before we deploy to all the other published boxes uh, to, to make sure that, oh, it works uh, well as expected on, on a limited uh, boxes. Uh, so for the, for the canary part of it, it's not just one published instance, it's, also, it's a combination of a published instance and a dispatcher instance. So in each of our codes, we have a dispatcher instance and a corresponding published instance, which, uh, which together form a canary instance. So then uh, at that point, you, you, you may have your uh, release pushed to those two boxes, and you can test just on those boxes to make sure that they are working correctly as you expect. And then you can push your release to all the rest of the boxes in production. All right. So next phase, and, and the last phase, but not least, uh, it is monitor. So this is to watch the performance of our sites. We want to make sure that the, uh, the sites are, perf uh, are performant. Uh, so a few things we do uh, on that front. The first thing we do is collection, collection of uh, performance metrics. So we define performance, performance metrics in our Java backend. Um, those, some of them are about like, the performance of 
the components, the servlets, the services, and also about the hardware boxes and all the bundles. Right? And then uh, we, we use JMX, which is out of box with the EM, uh, for the collection. And then we send them uh, through Kafka to uh, our LinkedIn uh, tool called InGraph, which is a tool for visualizing performance metrics. So by watching those graphs, we'll be able to tell like how the performance metrics uh, change over time, especially during deployment time and after deployment time. Right? And then we set predefined thresholds uh, to uh, get ourselves notified, alerted when things go wrong. Right? For example, errors uh, go beyond certain as a uh, ten times each uh, per second. Right? And in the meantime, we can also define that as an aggregate over multiple colos over different uh, tags of products. Yeah. And after that, uh, so in the meantime, we also do regression detection. So LinkedIn has good tools for detecting regression. So at the time of deployment, and, and after that, we uh, we get on those tools and see how uh, the the performance of the sites compare to the last week before the deployment. If there are changes uh, in those if, uh, detection, uh, uh, regression is detected, and then we take uh, action. So we, then we go back to our develop cycle to look into the issues and fix them. So yeah, so that well covers all the five phases that we wanted to cover as part of our development cycle. Um, and we are ready to take questions if you have. Uh, so, first question is, um, why do you prefer bundles and packages separately as opposed to just using the JCL installer? Okay. You said you have two different Gradle plugins, one to deploy just the bundles and another to deploy the content package. Well, actually, it's mostly building the uh, bundles, not deploying. We're deploying a single package. Uh, oh, so you're not actually deploying this part of it. Okay, yeah. got it. So yeah, so as I said, um, Gradle supports this multi-module uh, project structure. So in our case, uh, every Java, uh, Java bundle is a sub-module of the project, right? and it comes with its own build script. And that build script uses the Gradle uh, plugin for building the, the bundle. And then we also have another sub-module, which is for generating the, the package file. Exactly. Um, and then, the, was the picture that you showed up there just an example of when you, when you said single author instance in production, publish one dispatcher for each publish, and then Apache traffic server? Um, how many publish instances roughly do you actually have? So, um, yeah, so it's, it's three instances per data center, and it's not one to one, it's one to many. So, one dispatcher can send requests to all the publish instances. Gotcha. So it's just a diagram, not to make it, but uh, that's how we have. Roughly how many data centers? Like ballpark? Right now two, and we're going to three, and four. Gotcha. Yeah. And then my last question, I'll just I'll shut up. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned the, uh, the health check. Is that just like an Apache module that you wrote for the dispatcher to check the published bundles to make sure that we're all active? Or? I didn't catch exactly how that works. So basically, we are using dispatcher failover mechanism for the and the health check on publish instance, uh, health check URL on publish instance is going to be our key for determining its uh, health. So on failover, you can specify the URL that dispatcher can ping. So if there is a 500 error from publish instance, obviously dispatcher is going to ping the health check URL, and if health check is uh, response back with 500 then dispatcher automatically stops sending the request to publish instance. Gotcha. Just to that one. A question. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's just clarity around uh, the scalability pieces mm -hmm. that you were talking about. And then, so as you're scaling additional, so you have these sort of clusters, right? So mm -hmm. you get a one two pubs to two dispatchers. Mm -hmm. So if you have those sort of segments just sitting there, and then you're just like plugging them in so, to a load balancer, or are you physically just spinning them up dynamically? It, it is not physical. Um, 
So it, it is basically we are leveraging LinkedIn uh, infrastructure itself, where there are predefined hosts in a pool uh, sitting in the data center. And if there is a need for a new dispatcher, um, it is uh, going to be uh, spinned up automatically because uh, we are uh, the AEM application itself is uh, uh, embedded into a LinkedIn standard infrastructure uh, product template. So any the AEM application can be deployed using standard LinkedIn to, tools to any host. So let's say if we need to spin up a dispatcher, it is basically copying the Apache module and dispatcher module on top of it and then applying the config on top of it. Okay, it's just dispatcher, it's not published? You're, you're no, not published. The publish wow. obviously, it, it's a licensing involved, so it's just not published. Okay. That so that's good. that's why we want to make sure our application is stateless and we can leverage caching and dispatcher as much as we can. So it's not for this, publish. Okay, yeah. makes sense. Thanks. I'm just curious, you know, I'm a regular user of LinkedIn. What what part of LinkedIn is actually being served through AEM as opposed to a lot of the dynamic stuff that's there? Yeah, so uh, earlier, uh, I, uh, I think in the beginning of talk, I, I Oh, you were not here, probably. Yeah, yeah, so we showed uh, a few screenshots of those sites that we, we empower using AEM. Examples are like business.linkedin.com, uh, learning.linkedin.com, veterans.linkedin.com. Those are all for marketing and communication purposes. Not the www.linkedin.com that have the dynamic content. Okay. Right. Thank you. Every other sub that's not done with the space is the same as the The microsites, uh, you know, for, through AEM. Huh? Oh yeah, so, so yeah, we, later you will hear uh, part of the talk uh, elaborating on how we use AEM to empower even internal sites um, that are used by internal authors and an internal audience. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you for sharing this information with the community. This is something some other people can't do easily. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So you have this multi-data center. Some of the challenges we've had in the past is replication might fail. How do you ensure that the content gets replicated, that um, all of the different instances you know, get to see the same thing and people are not seeing this inconsistent view of the content? That's one question. Okay. Um, second one is, um, in terms of, you said, deployment of your artifact, and uh -huh. in that case, uh -huh. um, how come you guys haven't had a chance to, or explore Jenkins or something like that, which can, essentially, DevOps can just run the job and then does that for you, is that something that you couldn't use because it's not some tool that think that... We are, we are actually using that, uh, but so I'm, I'm gonna take the second question first, and later I'll let Apaji address the first question. Sure. He's, he's the one who takes care of all those content migration thing yeah. over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, for the second question, uh, for Jenkins, yes, we do use it, but uh, it's wrapped by our great LinkedIn tools team, which sits in, in this, they take the entire building, this building. Uh, so they have built a great tools uh, that are very much unified across all the LinkedIn engineering team. Right? And, and for us, we don't need to worry about Jenkins because it's, it's there. They are using Jenkins and they have lots of uh, hosts that run Jenkins jobs at all times. Uh, so uh, the entire uh, infrastructure, the, the, the infrastructure that we have been using for building, uh, for monitoring, all those stuff, uh, the effort was to uh, get ourselves on the LinkedIn tool chain so that we can leverage what they have provided instead of us managing say, our own Jenkins server. So yeah, so after uh, all the migration work we have done, we are now uh, hun almost 100% on LinkedIn tool chain and that makes our job much, much easier. I mean, it's actually better than what uh, a lot of apps are using. Because it's not the way it was it's having to be copied, it's all automated. Mm -hmm. So it's click and play. Even we can do an automation, right. it's continuous delivery, like we push right. the code and leave it. So in our so as a developer, basically my job is to um, check in the code and then 
after that, it, I'm not saying that I'm not, I'm not testing the code, but once it checks in, it goes through the pipeline by itself. It's all taken care of by the great tools that we have. I'll let Apache take care of the first question. With respect to content sync up not happening, um, so we didn't run into that issue as often, but uh, typically the source of truth is lying on agents on authors, right? So we can find that information on authors to make sure the content is uh, published to all the uh, all the publication agents. Uh, that is uh, one source of truth that we can leverage to determine whether content is synced up or not, or if there is any blocking queue uh, with respect to replication and uh, trigger that. I mean, uh, that as our triggering point to uh, see which one is doesn't have a content synced up and uh, taking it out of rotation and make a debug. So you have like one agent per publish, is that what it's actually? Yeah, uh, as of now, yes. Thanks everyone, I think uh, we're going to hand it over to Warren and uh, just one quick question. Uh, wanted to understand, do you have a Mongo MK or a Tar MK? Oh, it's Tar MK, it's not Mongo. Okay. We tried That's with Mongo MK for some time, uh -huh. uh, but since we don't have a DevOps support, uh, we don't want it to have any of supporting Mongo. Now, that, because now we have to support two applications, Mongo oh. and AMK. Right? Okay. Yeah, not only that, our use case is not uh, uh, required Mongo. Mongo. If you go for clustering and if you need a sync up need to happen on multiple instances, that's where we go for Mongo. I don't think there is a difference. We don't have Alright, cool. So we're gonna pass it on to Gladden and Varun for the next part of the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Pizza's here. Nobody uh, yeah, if anybody wants to help themselves. <laughs> here you go, Josh. Um, okay, uh, so here I think everybody here is familiar with, um, you know, being familiar with AEM, they're familiar with the concept of components. And AEM really has like a strong sense of components, right? So essentially, modular units on a page that provides specific functionality that you can string together in order to generate an entire page. And the, you know, the component architecture is very well laid out. And if you look, and this is evident when you see, for example, the, um, for example, this is a, uh, um, just a sample page. And in AEM, there's a sense of components where, for example, this is the banner component, and the sidekick has a sense of components in that it lists all the components for you and uh, it highlights the one, you know, shows you the ones that you can drag and drop onto a page. And we see this something similar with the backend side of AEM as well, um, with uh, Sling, for example, where there's, you know, you can have a component and it has a certain resource type. For example, in this case, it's resource one. And let's say you have another couple components. This one has a parent uh, resource type as well. Um, and then let's say, you know, we have another third component and it's of resource type three, and all of these can be strung together in order to generate one page. But what about JS, right? AEM, as far as we know, like doesn't really provide a strong sense of components for the front end. And you might say, well, what about client libraries, right? They come to the rescue. You can separate your code out via the client libraries and then include them onto the page and all is well. But when you end up using client libraries, you, you know, might end up getting code so that looks something like this. You have thousands of lines of code, and it might not necessarily be, uh, you, you might not have code separation there as much as you want. And then so you might say, oh, well, what about you know, Webpack or Require or um, you know, any of the other sort of JavaScript bundlers that you can use in order to create JavaScript modules on your page? And these are all really great as well, 
So you get the code separation that you can use in order to you know, instantiate separate modules on the page and use them uh, as need be, and you can you know, get the dependency management uh, as part of it as well. But the issue still is each one of those modules, once they get included on a page, you essentially have one giant file of JavaScript, and when each one of these modules executes, you, you, the, each of the modules is responsible for their own, for example, DOM manipulation or event bindings or anything like that. So you kind of run into the same issue where each module is responsible for its own sort of setup and teardown. And so that's kind of where, uh, that, what, where we come in, and like, that's what we were gonna focus on. So uh, I'm Varun, and uh, this is Gladden, and we're both uh, UI engineers here uh, at LinkedIn, and uh, we're here to talk about customizing AEM's front-end architecture. So uh, Gladden's gonna start us off with the first topic. Hi. So let's talk about component instantiation in the front-end. Uh, this is a typical scenario, you know, page loads, you see the DOM, uh, the, the, the DOM content loaded event fires, and that's when your JavaScript starts executing. So, say for example, uh, over here we have foobar and baz, these three uh, modules uh, that are going to run one after the other. Say foo is running right now, and it, it's it's foo's responsibility to you know find out what part of what part of the DOM uh, it, it's responsible for. So it, it, it needs to query that part of the DOM, you know, act on it, uh, do some event bindings, uh, you know, make some DOM manipulations if required, and similarly, uh, PAR acts after that, PAR, uh, you know, PAS acts, and it's all good. It, it, it sounds fine, right? Uh, but what about AJAX, right? Uh, we load some new content in, uh, and now the DOM has changed. What do we do now? What, how do we make sure that, uh, you know, uh, we have, uh, we reinitialize or rerun the JavaScript for this new uh, DOM that was, uh, or part of the DOM that was, uh, uh, you know, that, that we dynamically got in. Uh, so you might say, why, let's rerun the JS, or write the JS in such a way that uh, even if it runs twice, uh, we do some cleanup and remove the invalid event bindings uh, and you know uh, have have new event bindings and do the DOM manipulations again. But in this way, what you are doing is uh, you are giving the responsibility to do that to each module. So when you are writing a JavaScript for a particular uh, component, you, are, you give give the responsibility of figuring it out uh, to the component. And as you can see, uh, it's starting to look like spaghetti, right? So you don't know. Uh, you, so what we identify here is we. It will be really good to have a nice framework uh, for uh, for encapsulating uh, components on the front end as well. Uh, for the for Sling, uh, you know, you have a clear separation. There is resource type, and that they on the back end uh, that you have models, Sling models, or you know, WCM use classes. Uh, that are associated with a particular uh, component. Uh, so what we did was use use the same uh, uh, use the same um, model for, even for the front end. So what we introduced is for every component, we added a label uh, to the uh, to the markup that is generated, or like the, the container uh, that is generated. We added a you know component JS load path uh, data attribute. And marked it with the component name or the uh, or the resource type that it belongs to. Uh, how does this help us? So going back to the same uh, you know uh, problem that we had before. Uh, now uh, DOM slightly looks slightly different. Uh, it has uh, containers uh, which are clearly separated, and it has you know labels associated uh, telling you know what part of the DOM belongs to what component. Uh, how does this help? Uh, so the DOM, uh, so there is a DOM uh, content loaded event, and we introduce something called app loader. Uh, what what's the what does the app loader do? Uh, it calls uh, the component loader, which basically looks for these these chunks of DOM uh, uh, which are uh, uh, which are already on the page, and 
it iterates uh, through them one by one. It takes a look, uh, look at uh, you know component JS load path and you know feeds only that part of the DOM to the associated module. Uh, and you know uh, similarly for the for for bar and pass. Uh, this all looks fine, and you know how uh, this is going to help us. If you go to the next slide. See now. Uh, your page has loaded, your, all your JavaScript has been instantiated, uh, uh, and now some new content comes in uh, via Ajax. So the, we have the component loader listening for a, DOM cont uh, for a component load event. And um, once that event is fired after Ajax one, we need to explicitly fire it. And um, it goes back and uh, you know, scans the DOM again for any new components that have been added. And we, we have a clear uh, chunk of DOM uh, that we need to feed, feed in uh, since we have the label associated with it. Uh, see for, in this case, uh, a new component foo was added, right? So uh, we know that uh, from the attribute and we are going to feed the same uh, DOM, only that part of DOM to, the, uh, to, the, to, to its respective component. Uh, yeah, so what are the, what are the Oh, let's, let me show you, you know, uh, how it exactly looks like. So over here, uh, the component foo, uh, we have, you know, the class foo, and uh, it's, uh, we have the constructor and different, uh, different methods, and we are exposing this one uh, method called scope in it. And that's, that's, the, that's the method that, that the component loader is going to use uh, in order to, uh, you know, scope in it uh, that part of the component, uh, and this is this is what the component loader looks like. Uh, take a look at the init met uh, method here. Uh, we are adding um, an event listener for which listens for the component load event, which is fired every time we we bring in new components uh, via AJAX, and uh, it it triggers the load components uh, uh, method, uh, which queries the DOM for all such. Uh, you know, uh, data component JS path uh, instances, and then it feeds uh, them one by one uh, to their respective components. Uh, we'll share the slides so you can take a look. At it. So, what what benefits uh, does this offer to us? Uh, the, the the first benefit is spaghetti free code. So we have a proper framework to write uh, to encapsulate uh, front end components similar to back end components. Next one, uh, the way we do experimentation here in LinkedIn, uh, we, we have our own uh, uh, engine that tells you what experience to serve, and uh, we don't render that on the back end. So we do all of that on the front end. So that's why we need to uh, dynamically load components. And having a nice framework to encapsulate components, even on the front end, uh, helps us, you know, achieve uh, use our experimentation uh, framework and unit testing. Yeah, so since we have proper encapsulation of you know what DOM corresponds to what component, it, unit testing is a big, uh, JS unit testing becomes uh, really easy. Uh, I mean, and since everything is module, it becomes really easy. Uh, so talking about unit testing, uh, Varun is going to talk a bit more about how we do. Uh, GSU unit testing. Uh, sure. So, um, so when you think of unit testing, right? Um, you usually th you kind of have to step back and see what you know. What does unit testing really provide us, right? And I think this sort of comic sums it up really well. Um, which the uh, gist of it is, you know, QA is the main goal, right? You want to be able to test all of your code in with in the most efficient way, essentially, with the least amount of effort, such that you have confidence in your code that you can deploy to prod. And, you know, that in and of itself is a very noble and, like, good goal to have. But then if, if you know, if you layer unit testing, um, or if you, you know, layer things like, uh, for example, going back to what Bo was talking about, um, things like integration testing on top of unit testing, and then you know functional testing and also acceptance testing with the visual diff tools that we have, you can sort of ladder up to uh, something really awesome like uh, continuous integration or continuous delivery, depending on how far you want to take it. 
And that's really awesome because then as a developer, I can just code whatever it is I want, build, and then as part of the build, it will run the suite of tests, and then the tests will pass. And if they do, then it will automatically get put into the development pipeline, and then, as Bo was saying, the build process kicks off, and then it starts deploying to whatever it is, uh, whichever environment it is that we want it to go through, through the stages, for example, staging, and then on to prod. So having this sort of setup is, is really awesome, and the foundation of it is essentially unit testing, right? So how does unit testing normally work in industry? So you essentially have mock data, and you combine that, especially with uh, uh, JavaScript, you sort of need access to the DOM, so you have some sort of template as well that you need to interact with, and you essentially pass those, both, both those things off to some sort of template rendering engine, and out comes a fixture. And then you have your unit test that can use that fixture and run against it so that you can verify the changes that you've made on the uh, code that you're dealing with. So this looks fine and dandy, and it works really great for a lot of um, you know, stacks that are out there, right? Um, let's say like React or Ember or any other stack that you're probably on. But one problem here is that since we're on an ADM platform, uh, the issue is the template and the template rendering engine are encapsulated within AEM. And so it becomes difficult to render your fixtures offline, essentially, without a live running AEM instance. And so how do we sort of go around this problem so that we can have a, essentially, ideally, uh, ladder up to a continuous integration uh, setup, right? So the way we've sort of um, solved this is we have our JSON mock data as per usual, and what we do is we pass that off to something called a, we created a mock resource renderer, which is essentially a service um, that uh, proxies requests between uh, the AEM internals. Um, essentially, in this case, it takes the GSP, and if you, you know, as an example, we want to use GSP as the templates. It knows from the mock data what GSP it needs to render, so it, it pulls that in, and then it sends it off to the template rendering engine, which then gives it back the input. And so let's keep in mind that this is all within the context of AEM, and as that happens, then the mock resource renderer spits that code back out as an HTML fixture that unit test can then use. So um, let's take a look at what this mock resource renderer is all about, right? Um, so if we take a look at the code, the biggest piece of the mock resource renderer is this uh, sling request processor that uh, comes out of the box. And this is essentially a window into the internals of how sling works and uh, is pretty much gonna drive the entire interaction here. So uh, like anything else, because the mock resource renderer is proxying requests, we essentially have to fabricate a request. So we set up our mock request um, in order to pass it in. And we also set up a mock response so that we can capture the, res the result that we get from the uh, process uh, request. And then all it is is we just call the process request function on the, requ uh, the sling request processor. And that fires off the internal mechanisms that would normally happen if you visited a page via Sling, um, except we are you know, programmatically launching those. And uh, in the end, you just capture the output that comes out of the process and spit it back out onto the page. So with, with doing something like this, essentially, we've, uh, um, like, we have to think about why we have to go through all this uh, process, right? <laughs> Um, and the biggest thing we get out of this is uh, essentially maintainability. Um, if, you, uh, if you sort of think about how you create a component in, in, in AEM, the process is pretty simple, right? You just go onto a page, you open up the dialog, oops, you open up the dialog, and out comes a component, and you can essentially now, with this process, just go to the JSON representation of that component, and this is your mock data. And you can just feed that directly into the mock resource renderer servlet and dynamically generate how many other fixtures you want. And the biggest boon of that is 
for example, if you look at the same diagram, but then you add a few more different sort of uh, sets of mock data and the fixtures that you're gonna require out of those. So let's say unit test depends on multiple fixtures in order to run the test suite. Um, this process is still gonna work because regardless of how many uh, changes, for example, you might have how many variations in your mock data, or let's say you have you know, your JSP template changes at some point in the future, you don't really have to update any of your fixtures. Whereas, for example, if you were to store all of your fixtures in, let's say, hard, like static HTML files, and your template changed at some point, you'd essentially have to manually go in to each one of those uh, fixture files and update them. Whereas in this case, you just, the mock data is still the same. You pass that into the resource renderer servlet, and it uses the template that's already been coded out as part of the, you know, the template that you use to render the component originally on a page, and then spits out all of the HTML fixtures for you that your unit test can then go use. Um, which is, you know, that's pretty much what we want to do, right? We want to scale as much as possible and take the manual work out of um, doing things like unit testing. So uh, that's essentially it. Any questions? Um, in the case of mocking, are you guys just testing at the component level or at the, or at the page level in this case? Yeah, so in, in terms of unit testing, we do it at the component level. So uh, like Gladden was saying with the, uh, the foo example, for example, um, the let's say you have a component called foo, we have the one JS file that corresponds to that component, and so essentially we're unit testing that uh, individually. So it's at the component level. Any chance we can see a demo? <laughs> uh, yeah, if we have time at the end, um, we, we can definitely throw up a demo for you. More questions? Hi. <laughs> you again. <laughs> so, uh, you, the, you guys talked really nice about the, uh, the problem of how client lets get concatenated and therefore you end up in this long blob of JavaScript. You know, what about the CSS? Do you also, I know you don't, I mean, you, the CSS gets concatenated as well when you, when you put it inside the client level once you debug it. So like, is that something you guys are looking at or you just not care because it's CSS? Uh, so we have a very similar process for CSS, but though um, because we use preprocessors, we use SAS, the way we structure it in the SAS is we just we essentially just have a, uh, a namespace per component. So like for example, the banner case, we just have banner as the as the namespace, and uh, <laughs> uh, and you have all your relevant banner CSS within that namespace. But then I guess like when it gets compiled out to regular CSS, it's all just one blob, anyways. So we don't have the problem with dynamic loading with CSS, right? So if you, even if you load anything dynamically, uh, you don't have to worry about reinitializing the CSS. It's the browser is going to take care of it on itself. So concatenation is not really a problem. Like reinitializing. Gotcha. Um, and then about the component load event that you're that you're listening for in order to, uh, you know load in whatever JavaScript you need uh, as a specified uh, data attribute you guys have. Um, is that component, is the responsibility to throw that component load event on the developer who creates the component? Or is there something that's automatically like going to throw that component load event on something that gets added to the development? So uh, the responsibility uh, is on uh, the Ajax. Uh, so whatever component is, uh, whatever component or say for example experimentation component, right? It, it is doing the Ajax call. So you know when the Ajax is done, I just need to fire this component load event in order to re or initialize any new component that has been um, that has been brought in using the Ajax call. If you don't really have to specify what got in, you just need to fire an event saying 
component has loaded, reinstalls. So it's the responsibility of the, the responsibility of whoever is bringing in the dynamic components. Gotcha. And then last one, only because it's near and dear to my heart, is the uh, you mentioned that you switched over to doing client side rendering of experiment like treatments that come back from from licks. Um, so how do you avoid kind of like the flashing in of the content that will happen when you do that client side? You have a spin. You just do a spinner and then... Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty... Um, so we are not doing complete pages. Actually, we are doing uh, on some instances, but um, we, we like to try, we want to try to avoid that. Uh, so I understand, you know, flashing of content is bad, uh, but we can't really avoid it in our case. Um, so that's why we, for slightly better user experience, we have a spinner. Gotcha. Thanks. All right, so I'm going to hand off to Paul and Ali.